page 183. Um, the theology that he's presenting is, which is something that uh, I believe the Chidush Harim, a Hasidish master, once said as well, where is God? Anywhere you invite him in. And when it comes to the spiritual uh, quality of Eretz Yisrael, the spiritual quality of Eretz Yisrael and God's closeness to the land of Israel is directly dependent upon the degree to which we invite Hashem to come back to our midst. And the reason why there was a lower level of Shekhinah, less of a concentrated, palpable Shekhinah during the Second Temple era was directly because the Jewish people did not come back in full force uh, to invite Hashem to meet them. So the more we show up, if we show up in full force, Hashem will show up in kind in full force. If our participation and our invitation to God is lackluster, so then Hashem will respond in a tepid way as well. So this is the thesis that Rabbi Huda Leif presents to us on page 183. And he's directly relating it to a discussion of Kedusha Ta'aretz, of the holiness of the land of Israel. That the land's holiness requires the Jewish people's participation in bringing Hashem back. Because the Jews uh, that were living in the Bavel diaspora did not come back in full force, so the, the, the temple was built, and Hashem came back into the temple, but only... It, 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 in a, within a shadow of what he was during the first temple. And so we're up to paragraph two on the bottom of the page. He says, perhaps this is what Shlomo meant when he said, I am asleep, but my heart is awake. Ani yeshena vilibi er. He says, likening diaspora Jewry to one who is asleep. Although one is sleeping, the heart is still awake and beating. And this represents the constancy of prophecy that was still among them and awaiting their return. And in that same verse it says, a voice, my beloved Knox, which refers to God's beckoning, call to return to Eretz Yisrael. And my head is filled with dew, refers to the divine presence, which departed from the shelter of the temple and was waiting outside, as one who waits outside while the dew collects on his head. And, of course, remember I mentioned this uh, last time, that we're dealing with a, um, I'm just going to take a, a, a chumash, and I'll read for you the entire passage from, uh, from Shir Hashirim. The analogy is to a woman who has just gone to bed, and she has already done everything that she needs to get into bed. She's gotten undressed, gotten into her pajamas, removed all of her adornments, and then all of a sudden, behold her beloved Knox. So it says, Kol do di do fake. I'm sleeping, but my heart is still beating. In other words, there's still life within the Jewish people, even though we've dozed off, and we no longer feel that same intensity and that same yearning. Kol do di do fake. But look, there's a voice, there's a sound of the, the knocking of my beloved. And the voice says, open up the door for me, my sister, my beloved. Yonati tamati, my dove, my pure one. Shiroshi nimlatal kevutsotai resise laila. My head is filled with dew. Kevutsotai, my black curls are, are, the, are the, um, the curls of the night. And so she wants, the, the, the beloved knocks, and, and he wants to come in. So, Pashatati as Kutanti. So the next verse says, and this is when it says, what we're reading from the Kuzari, when it later says, I have removed my robe. I've already taken off my, my clothing. This refers to the sluggishness of the Jewish people to return, like one is who, who is too lazy to don his robe and answer the door. And Echacha El Bashana, the Pasuk continues, is how can I, you want me to get dressed again? Rachatzti et raglai, Echacha Atanafem, I've already washed my feet before getting into bed. 
Now I'm going to have to get them dirty by stepping on the floor again, and I'm going to have to wash my feet again. Come on. And then, Dodi shalach ya dominachor. But then my beloved sticks his hand into the hole. In those days, if you wanted to open the door, there was a little hole in the door, a gap in the door so that you could stick your hand in and pull the latch open. But here, if the latch is already locked, then even if you stick your hand in, you can't open it. It's almost like a gate that has a latch on the inside. So my beloved sticks his hand inside the hole for the, to grab the latch. And my innards yearn for him. And so uh, Rabbi Yudha Levi says, my beloved sends, sent his hand through the gap of the door, refers to Ezra, Nehemiah, and other prophets who urged the people to return to Eretz Yisrael. Come back, they said, until some finally agreed to return. This is like a friend who is standing outside and extends his hand through a gap in the door to attract his friend inside. But their consent to return was not wholehearted, as it says, and Yehuda said, the strength of the bearer of burdens has weakened. Now this is from Sefer Nehemiah that he's quoting at this point. And as I point out in the footnote, in footnote 188, the context of this verse is that when it came time for the dwellers of Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, attempts were made to foil their plans. Their reaction was that their strength was waning as a result of all of the resistance, which demonstrated a less than wholehearted readiness to rebuild. As soon as the Jewish people encountered resistance, obstacles, they felt weakened. They felt they didn't feel the same level of resolve. And God, in return, repaid them in accordance with what was hidden in their hearts, so that all the holiness that returned was in a diminished state, commensurate with their diminished state. This is because divinity rests upon a person only in proportion to the person's receptivity to it, be it great or small. Were we to properly prepare ourselves to greet the God of our ancestors with a whole heart and a desirous soul, we would encounter him in the same miraculous way that our ancestors did in Egypt. And so, if you, we continue reading from this Pasuk and Shir, in the Pesukim and Shir Hashirim, Pasuk Hay says, Kam ani liftoch lidodi. So finally I got up out of bed. Ah, got to get up, he keeps knocking. What's the incessant knocking? I finally got up to get to, to open the door for my beloved, the Yadai not more. My hands were dripping with the myrrh lotion that I'd already put on. The Etzbaotaimor over al Kapotamanul, and my fingers have this myrrh lotion, and I have to put it on the lock of the door because you know you put on your cream at night, whatever that stuff is, right? <laughs> Times haven't changed, right? Patachtiani, pasachtiani ledodi vedodi chamakavar. So finally, I open up the door for my beloved, and my beloved has disappeared. In other words, by the time I got to the door, he was already gone. And nafshi yatsavid abro bikashti uvelo mitzasiu kerasi velo anani. And so my soul departs with his words. And so I seek him out, and I can't find him. I call out to him, but he doesn't answer. And I therefore say to all of the other people of the world, Mitzauni hashomrim hasovavim ba'ir hikuni fitzauni nasuet rididi me'alai shomrei hachomot. And so uh, this is all metaphor, but it's basically she's saying uh, they, they found me. Uh, the enemy watchmen patrolling the city, they struck me, they blooded me, wreaking God's revenge upon me. They stripped my mantle of holiness from me, the angelic watchmen of the wall. And so therefore, she's basically saying, as I went outside, I, got, I, I was struck because of people didn't understand what I was running outside for, half-dressed and so forth. But the reality is, is that this is the punishment to the Jewish people, that because we did not open the door for Hashem, not only were we, did we have to suffer at the hands of other nations, but Hashem disappeared and didn't come back into our house in the way that we would have wanted him to come in. So this is the idea of kol do do fake. The, there are many times in our history when you have to hear the knocking on the door. And if we don't respond to the knocking of the door, then we have to be prepared to pay the consequences of our own sloth and negligence. And it's too late. Too late. It's, sometimes it's too late, but there are always um, renewed chances that Jewish history provides for the Jewish people. And it's not guaranteed that it's going to happen in every generation, the, the knocking. But
But at different junctures in Jewish history, we have to know when the knocking is taking place. It certainly took place when it came time to build the second temple. And the Jewish people did not respond to the knock in the way that they should have. And so you know Rav Soloveitchik wrote that Neus as the Mrs. Sochashevsky uh, referenced it uh, last week at the end of the year. You can say, Oldo di do Right? What did you say? I always thought that Rav Soloveitchik had created this idea of the knocking of the state of Israel. You know, that he, he, he invented this idea himself. But the reality is, is that what was he basing himself on? He was basing himself on the Kuzari where Rabbi Yehuda Halevi creates this correlation between the return to Zion and the knocking that is described in Shir Hashirim. And um, so I just have just an, uh, it's a very long essay if you read it in its original. So I just brought you an encapsulation of uh, the Rav's essay, which we'll just go over very quickly. His, his preface to the idea of the six knocks, he, Rav Soloveitchik had said that God in our generation, he writes this in 1956, he says, God in our generation is knocking at the door. We've, we, we must hear the knocking on the door of Kol Dodido Fake, of our beloved is knocking. Um, and of course, he writes this just a few years after the founding of the state, just a few years after the Shoah. And so he writes as follows. He says, eight years ago, in the midst of a night of terror filled with horrors of Majdanek, Treblinka, and Buchenwald, in a night of gas chambers and crematoria, in a night of absolute divine self-concealment, Hester Panimuchlat, in a night ruled by the Satan of doubt and apostasy, which sought to sweep the maiden from her house into the Christian church, in a night of continuous searching, of questing for the beloved, in that very night the beloved appeared. God, who conceals himself in his dazzling hiddenness, suddenly manifested himself and began to knock at the tent of his despondent and disconsolate love, twisting convulsively on her bed, suffering the pains of hell. You notice how he has changed the metaphor. In Shir Hashirim, it is a maiden of complacency. It is a maiden who has already gotten undressed and is comfortable in her bed and therefore does not respond to the knock. In Rav Soloveitchik's analogy, because he was witness to the ravages of the Shoah in his lifetime, he describes a maiden who refuses to get out of bed because she's convulsing with pain, racked with pain. As a result of the knocks on the door of the maiden wrapped in mourning, the state of Israel was born. How many times did the beloved knock on the door of the tent of his love? It appears to me that we can count at least six knocks. This is just a, an, ab an abridgment of those knocks. First, number one, first the knock of opportunity was heard in the political arena. No one can deny that from the standpoint of international relations, the establishment of the state of Israel in a political sense was an almost supernatural occurrence. And of course, you know, what he's referring to is the vote of the UN, the United Nations, in 1947 to approve the partition plan and to uh, ratify the founding of the state of Israel and to recognize it as a state among other nations. And that, he says, the fact that both the Soviet Union and the United States were finally able to agree on one thing during that, uh, that very difficult Cold War period is in itself a supernatural occurrence. That's the first knock of uh, the Ribbon Shalom. Second, the knocking of the beloved could be heard on the battlefield. The small Israeli defense forces defeated the mighty armies of the Arab countries. A miracle of the many in the hands of the few took place before our very eyes. So the miracle of the milchamot, of the wars, that he is in witness, he's writing this in 56, he's the, uh, the War of Independence, the uh, the, the war, uh, what, would he, what did they call the 56th War of the Sinai? The, the Suez, Suez Canal War, right? The Sinai, Mount Sinai War, right? That's the second knock, the miracle of uh, this, the Rabin um, Biad Me'atim, like we say in al -Anisim. Third, the beloved began to knock as well on the door of the theological tent, and it may very well be that this is the strongest knock of all. All the claims of Christian theologians that God deprived the Jewish people of its right in the land of Israel, and that all the biblical promises regarding Zion and Jerusalem refer in an allegorical sense to Christianity and the Christian church, 
have been publicly refuted by the establishment of the State of Israel and have been exposed as falsehoods, lacking all validity. And we don't really relate to this so much in the 21st century when we don't really see Christianity as posing a great threat to Judaism. But imagine before the establishment of the state, where the church, this is before Vatican II, this is before the church, the, the Catholic Church has officially disavowed you know, anti-Semitism and the, that the foundation of the Christianity is founded on the Jews killing Christ. The belief was that everything in the Bible that talks about the Jews returning to Zion is a metaphor because the Jews will never return to Zion. The Jews are, are lost people and therefore the, there's this supersessionism like we've talked about in the past that, that the Christians really supplant the Jews as the chosen people and that the return to Zion is metaphor. Look at what happened. The, the theological um, earthquake, the earth theological tsunami that takes place with the establishment of the state of Israel. And the Catholic Church now has to revise its understanding of scripture. That's revolutionary. That's another knock on the door. Fourth, the beloved is knocking in the hearts of the perplexed and assimilated youths. The era of self-concealment hastarat panim at the beginning of the 1940s resulted in great confusion among the Jewish masses and in particular among the Jewish youth, buried hidden thoughts and paradoxical reflections emerge from the depths of the souls of even the most devout assimilationists. And once a Jew begins to think and contemplate, once his sleep is disturbed, who knows where his thoughts will take him, what form of expression his doubts and queries will assume. So the establishment of the state of Israel began to awaken within even very distant Jews, even very secular Jews, the sense not only of nationalism, but of a religious identity as well. And it started to get people thinking, and who knows, and especially after the theological um, disaster of the Shoah, which didn't just physically destroy a third of our population, but also spiritually destroyed so many, because people said, where is God? There is, how could God do this right, to our people? Right, but with the founding of the state of Israel, there starts to become some, some view, some glimpse of the Almighty in part, as part of some divine plan. So that also is a knock, as, a, as the fourth knock at the door. The fifth knock of the beloved is perhaps the most important of all. For the first time in the history of our exile, divine providence has surprised our enemies with the sensational discovery that blue, Jewish blood is not free for the taking, is not hefker. Jewish blood does have sanctity. You cannot spill Jewish blood with impunity. And that was part of the, you know, he's speaking also in the wake of the Nuremberg trials, but also more importantly with the founding of the state. Jews, Jewish blood is holy. Jewish blood is, is human. Jewish blood is, is, is sanctity. It's not hefker. So that's the fifth knock. And finally, the sixth knock, he says, which we must not ignore, was heard when the gates of the land were opened. A Jew who flees from a hostile country now knows that he can find a secure refuge in the land of his ancestors. Now that the era of divine self-concealment is over, Jews who have been uprooted from their homes can find lodging in the Holy Land. We now have a place we can go home to. And that's the sixth knock. So. Rav Soloveitchik suggested that a Jew has to hear those knocks and realize that this is a game changer in so many ways, the founding of the state. There's a tremendous irony here because I don't think that the same knocking is audible in the way that it was audible when Rav, when Rav Soloveitchik wrote this essay in 1956. We who are living in the year 2015, it's already 67 years after the establishment of the state, what about the, the younger generation, the people who, do not, who were not around when the state was founded, who were not around even for the 67 war, um, people who are in their 30s or 40s and just don't have that collective memory? What do you, what do the, have, have those people even heard the knock? You know, when you're born into a state of Israel that's already in existence, you take it for granted that the Jewish people have a homeland. So, 
when you're not living through this kind of dramatic paradigm shift in the history of the Jewish people, so then it's very hard to hear the knocking. The knocking, the maybe, the, you know, the echoes of the knocks are still, you might still be able to pick up if you are a student of history. But if you're not a student of history, like most people, then it's very hard to see these knockings on the door that happened only 67 years ago. And, uh, and that's part of the problem that we run into today when you find so many um, North American Jews who are disaffected. They don't hear the theological knock of the, of the state of Israel. And they don't hear the nationalistic knock of that this is a place where Jews can call home because uh, the Holocaust happened so long ago. And uh, we don't appreciate, even though it's funny, even though John Kerry just said a couple of weeks ago that you really, Jews cannot, the only place that Jews can feel truly secure is in the state of Israel because there are no guarantees. I mean, I don't even, I wasn't, I don't know what the context was. He said this to a Jewish audience, but it was almost like a mini prophecy that he said because, I mean, even, even though he meant it as a, as a way of saying that the Jews, we love the Jews of America, mm -hmm. but he was also prophetically saying, like he usually does put his foot in his mouth, that there is no place that is safe for the Jews except for, for the state of Israel. But most people, don't, most people don't hear the knocks. Most people don't hear the knocks of the military might of the Israeli army because they attribute it to a, a certain kind of work ethic, a certain kind of training, a certain kind of of discipline that the Israelis have that the, uh, of the other nations, the Arab nations, don't have. So all a lot of these knocks are not that audible to a newer generation. So the question is, how do we, um, is there a way for us to reclaim the knocks for the, 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 the voice of the sound of the beloved knocking on the door? The challenge of how to reclaim the sound of the knock when we're not living through these dra dramatic changes in, in the Jewish history. How do we present these as knocks to, to a newer generation? Anyone have an answer? Social media. Yes. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't an answer. It's an additional problem. Uh, one of the, I follow this really uh, local history fairly closely. And what, one thing that is concerning me right now is the level of enmity between groups in Israel, um, well, everything from the policemen beating up an Ethiopian soldier to the riots to the, the general state of tension, which you can put down to the psychological pressure of what's going on outside, but also the corruption. And if God comes to us in commensurate with our level of acceptance of his laws, uh, I'm concerned about the effect of the general malaise in Israel right now on the future of Israel. So that's... Yeah, I mean, it's a valid point. I, you know, I don't know... Rabbi Huda Levi didn't say that it depends upon our acceptance of his laws. It just, it's predicated on our acceptance of the invitation that God is knocking at the door and I don't know whether he requires every Jew to be from in order to be able to have the Shechina return to Zion. If, if, as we mentioned last time, the Jews who did return were not, by and large, religious Jews. We pointed out from the Sefer Nehemiah that they had, were intermarried. They had never experienced a sukkah in their entire life, living in the diaspora. So these were not pious Jews necessarily, but they were Jews who, had, who heard the knock. And I wasn't really talking about Funkite. I was talking about general morality and ethics. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, and I, I hear you. In other words, there's... Uh, I, but, but, but I will say this. Israeli society, with all of its flaws, is not nearly as flawed as the way many Jews portray it to be. Compare Israeli society and Israeli culture with any other country in the, in the world today, and I think you'll find that Israel has... Um, has a lot to hold up its head for. I mean, look, for example, what we just did in Nepal. And I uh, just saw there's a graphic chart mm -hmm. of all of the different countries that sent, uh, you know, uh, aid to the earthquake victims. And Israel was like, you know, 
30 or 40 like little uh, graphics on the chart, and every other country was like a half of a thing or a two or three. Where did you see this? I don't remember. I must have seen it on Facebook or something. Someone must, or someone sent it to me. I'll put it out in this week's email so you can see it for yourself. So, yeah, Israel has a lot of problems. There's racism in Israel. I'll probably want to speak about that on Shabbos as well, having just come back from Baltimore this past Shabbos and then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then opening the news to find that uh, the protests are taking place in Israel as well. Yeah, so Israeli society does have problems. There's racism. There's inequality, there's discrimination, there's a lack of unity, there's corruption, even among religious, the religious sector in Israel. Um, there's selfishness, there's greed. All of the things that make a human society human exist in Israel. But I think at the same time, um, um, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't buy into the the hypercriticism that takes place in the media about Israel, and the hypercriticism that Israelis themselves uh, say about themselves, because we are the most hypercritical people about ourselves. I, and we learn that. I mean, that's part of our history, is we always learn how to be self-critical. That's what the Chumash is all about. What other religion has a book, its holy book is filled with stories about the sinfulness of its people? Very, very few. I don't, I, I'm not sure that you can point to any other book that sort of does that. That's, that's the, 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 the under, underlying theme of uh, Shmos and Bamidbar and Devarim is to talk about all the sins that the Jewish people did by defying God. And then you have all of the Nevi'im talk about all of the ep episodes in Jewish history where the Jewish people fell short of the expectations and they sinned and therefore they were punished. Um, so that's how we've learned over the centuries to always inflate all the bad things that we do and play down all the good things that we do. That's why Israel is so terrible at Hasbara. We're so terrible at um, public relations because we're just not used to, we don't feel comfortable touting all of our achievements and the good things that we do. It's not what we're about as a people. We're about introspection and self flagellation and guilt and all of the and all of the terrible things that we've done and look at this and look at that and that's that's part of why we argue with each other so many times but listen uh, at the end of the day your point is well taken if the if Israeli society continues to fall short in so many ways then we cannot expect miraculous redemption to take place and therefore we need to always try harder even on that note, Rabbi, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There is so much good that is coming out of Eretz Yisrael, the chesed. The, I think of my children and, and grandchildren and their friends. I'm not just outing my kids. An outing for a birthday is a chance to get do something with your parents. And where do you want to go? To the Kotel. Going to the Kotel is like this exciting even if they've been there a month right. before. It's not Disneyland, it's the Koto. Yeah. Okay, and the chesed that's done, the help that, you know, in their yeshuvim, how they help each other, how they organize. I know we do this here too, but it's just um, the learning that's going on, and, and there are just amazing things happening, you know, being Adam Lachavero and being Adam Lachavero also. You know, it's just, uh, it's incredible that it doesn't exist here. All right, good. It doesn't exist here. got together when the four boys were missing. Yes, um, I mean, everybody in Israel was united and looking for them and trying and when, you know, yep. same thing. I mean, then, then they put everything aside, religious, not religious, right. everybody. Right, everyone came together. together. Right. Yep, yep, what else? It was interesting that Rabbi Salvage himself didn't go to live in the land of Israel. I mean, he was there briefly at some point. Yeah, he was actually up for the uh, chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. Yes. At one time, and I think he, I think he, he recognized election. what? He lost yeah, he lost the election, and I think he probably recognized that. You know, there are there have been great personages who just really never felt that they had a place in Israeli society. Towering, towering Gedolei Hador, Rav Soloveitchik, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, or the Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, who was the Balsri Deish. 
And the, the, Rav, Rav Weinberg actually uh, openly acknowledged why he didn't feel he would ever fit in in Israeli society, which is why he didn't make Ali. He spent the, 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 the remainder of his life after the war in Montreux, uh, was it Montreux, I think, in, in Switzerland. And he, he had explained that, uh, you know, he says, there's so much, um, he, said, he felt he would fall between the cracks. He, he didn't know, he, there, there's such a divide, he said, between the uh, religious Zionist world and the Haredi world. He says, I don't know where I would belong. I, I don't feel, he, he, like he was, you could read in a, a letter that he wrote to a friend of his, his angst, that he just didn't feel that there was a place for him in Israeli society to be able to be productive. Which, of course, is not an excuse for not making Aliyah, but if you feel that as a leader of the Jewish people you would need to contribute something vital, clearly, I think, in retrospect, when we look at the life of Rav Soloveitchik and what he accomplished in North America, in retrospect, that was his place. His place was. I mean, of course, a person could challenge that and say, well, what if he would have made Aliyah? Who's to say that maybe he would have transformed uh, Israeli society in the same way? It's not so easy to know. Not so easy to know, but culturally, he was very, very distant from what Israeli society, Israeli culture, is all about. And the same thing could be said about the Lubavitcher Rebbe and so many other great Gedolei Israel who really felt that their major contribution had to take place outside of Israel. But it's not that he didn't hear the knocking. I hear the knocking, and I understand that this is the new reality for the Jewish people. But my role in, in this new change in Jewish history will continue to remain in North America. Yes? Rabbi, but what, have we, what have we learned from the Holocaust, really? I mean, look at the corruption that happened in Europe with the Jewish people. I mean, they, I think a lot of it was caused by the Jewish people with the corruption and, um, you know, even among the, the Orthodox Jews. and. All of this is still happening in Israel today. Like, I mean, you know, it sounds like... I, I don't think you mean what, what, it, what you sound like you mean. I don't think you mean to say that the corruption that was existing in Jewish communities in Europe was the cause of the Holocaust. Well, That's, what was the cause of the Holocaust? Well, it was, you know... Anyway, I, I, you know, I, it, it's, a much, it's, a, it's a much longer discussion, but it's certainly... I don't well, think some, you can... Some rabbis believe that it, it was because, you know, about the Jewish people themselves did, well, in, 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 in trying to do our own introspection is how, you know, we can mourn the, the Shoah, there's no question that we have to take stock, and uh, just like the Gemara does at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple, and looks at what the sins of the Jews that existed in that generation to try to be able to learn from them. I'm sure that many rabbis would say that that might be an appropriate exercise for those who want to be able to learn from the from the mistakes that perhaps might have been made, but I don't think that there's anything that we could point to specifically that could account for the sheer magnitude of genocide that took place and say, oh, this was because of something that the Jewish people did or didn't do. Um, it's, it's a much, much bigger issue. But to say that Jews are human beings and repeat the sins of their fathers because of the very fact that we are flawed human beings is true. It's, of course it's true. And the, the, the challenge, of course, is, is to always rise above uh, our humanity and try to become as perfect as we can. And we, we know that we're going to fall short. So what why we come back to shul every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and say vidoy for the very same things that we said that we repented for last year. We, and we know in advance that we're not going to be perfect and we're not going to get it right every time. Uh, but that's the, um, that's the perennial story of the Jewish people, is that we know that, uh, uh, we know that we have a responsibility, and we know that we usually fall short of those responsibilities, and we have to try harder. That's constantly our struggle. Yes? Um, I was just going to say, uh, because of all the assimilation, isn't that what brought about the Holocaust? because we, we don't serve God the way we're supposed to, it says in the Hamish. So, so let, let, me, let me be very clear, and, and I, I, don't want to, I don't want to engage in this discussion in any greater length or depth, because it's painful for some people to hear these suggestions. Um, but what I will say is, and we have to be very clear about this, there is no clear indication uh, what 
the Jews did to contribute to the Holocaust. Any rabbi or holy person or leader who, who is so bold as to make such an assertion or suggestion that it's either because of corruption or because of assimilation or because Jews ate pork or because we didn't observe the Shabbos properly is acting it foolishly in my opinion. And the reason why it's foolish is because there have been many, many, many generations of Jews, including our own, who have done far more, uh, committed far more uh, serious offenses against the Torah and have lived lives of tranquility and calm and peace. And it's, not, it's therefore not only inaccurate to say, to point to something that the Jews may or may not have done as being the cause for the Holocaust, but it's, 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 um, it's theologically a travesty to suggest that. And what's more, it's hurtful to people who have lost loved ones during the show and to say that they died because of either their own sins or the sins of their contemporaries. So I don't think, it's, I don't think it serves anyone well to, uh, to engage in these kinds of discussions. Um, and it actually does more harm than good to actually uh, speculate about these kinds of things.